Welcome to another episode of Just Some Points. I'm, uh, as every week, I'm looking forward to what's new. And I hear from uh, Catherine and Melissa, who are our digital team, um, what they found, what's new. Um, who wants to start? Catherine, why are you first today? Sure. So this week, I'm going to talk about the new Q&A feature that TikTok is launching. So what it is, it's um, users can comment on posts just like normal, but they can click an extra button to have their comment be listed as a question so that the creators can go back and answer the questions either by like text comment um, or they can create a video with the comment. So it's pretty much just like normal, except it'll take TikTok has a new feed now where it takes all of the questions listed as or comments listed as questions um, and puts it in one feed so that people can go and see it. Um, the reason that I wanted to talk about this is because it's something that I've noticed across TikTok. Just I started scrolling through it recently and I noticed that so many people ask the creators questions as simple as lifestyle questions about the people to what where's that shirt you're wearing from and things like that. So I think that it's just a great new option that TikTok has and it really shows that they're paying attention to how their users interact with the app and they're really evolving with how people are using it. Um, so it just kind of shows that they really care about the users and they want to create the best platform for them. Um, and again, with all the competition that we're talking about with, you know, the YouTube shorts and Instagram reels and all those new, um, how people are kind of using that in the video based into their platform. I think it's just great to show that TikTok is kind of saying one step ahead of everybody else and just going along with um, what users want to see on the platform. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm not a TikTok user per se, but I, I would say I will probably watch some TikTok videos every day because my adult kids <laughs> just sent them off. And, and I, the last few, I would say the last two months, I felt like there also a switch a little bit of the type of TikToks you get and the type of content you get. You get, you don't just get the goofy stuff. You get more, more also brands and other stuff. Uh, and I'm wondering what you're just talking about. If that is also part of a result, a part result of, TikTok getting into education. We talked about that last year at one point that I think they had some pilots going in England. I haven't followed it, um, what, what the status is on that, but they wanted, they had some partnerships in England where they we want to use the TikTok, TikTok platform for education purposes, mm -hmm. for which, you know, Q&A should probably make a lot of sense. Um, so it would be, interesting. it's interesting. I definitely feel that after the whole politicization actually went away the last few months around TikTok. They moved on and are now, you know, keep transforming somehow. Right. Yeah, I, I also think that this new feature kind of gives uh, more quality to the engagement that videos are getting. You know, it's, it's no longer just sharing links and liking, you know, a video. It's actually engaging with these creators and these brands that are going to start using these features. So I think that it's also going to just start driving like much more high quality uh, engagement overall. I would agree with that. You know, the last week we talked about Facebook and how we're all kind of confused what the strategic direction is that they're all over the place. With TikTok, I, feel, I find I just have the opposite impression that they know exactly what they're working on and the direction they want to go and how they actually improve and expand their, their, their platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Keep, keep, uh, keep close to that and keep watching that. I mean, it would be interesting to see you know, how they evolve and we should keep reporting on that. Yeah. Um, Melissa? Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually a follow-up to one of our previous uh, episodes regarding uh, WordPress versus Squarespace, Wix, and other proprietary systems. Um, this past week, WordPress uh, launched 5.0, which is called uh, Esperanza. And there are a lot of new features that actually highlight what we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, where WordPress is really transforming and becoming a more user-friendly, known for um, 
no website development knowledge, no coding knowledge needed whatsoever in order to create these websites. Um, historically speaking, WordPress was never seen in the same light as Squarespace and Wix. Everybody thought you needed, it was more complex and everybody thought you needed some sort of, you know, uh, coding experience in order to achieve what you were looking for. Um, Cause it's a very native platform that you pretty much have to manu uh, manually work yourself. Whereas like Squarespace does a lot of the work for you. Um, but a lot of these new features in 5.7 uh, are going to make a really big difference and a really big push. Uh, the first one being uh, one click uh, conversion between HTTP to HTTPS. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of you who don't know, um, in order for your website to be secure, you need an SSL certificate. And back in the day, it used to be a very cumbersome process to get that SSL certificate installed. Um, but with this 5.7 update, it's literally one quick, one click and you make that change and you don't have to do any site files. Um, there's no risk of breaking your site like there was in the past. Um, so that's a really- Do they provide the SSL? Yes, I, I believe they do. Or, uh, or you get it from your domain and it's just like a one click switch. Um, so uh, that was you know, a very daunting thing that's going to make a really big difference uh, in, in how the public views, how easy it is to use WordPress. Um, the second uh, biggest update I saw was regarding their editor feature, their native editor. Um, previously, a lot of people relied on third party plugins that were page builders so that you could easily drag and drop and create blocks and things like that. Um, but this new native editor is going to have that drag and drop feature and they're going to have uh, reusable blocks where you can save blocks as a library and then you can pull them into other pages. Um, it's a, you know, a whole lot more that you can do with this native plugin, uh, native WordPress feature than with a, a plugin anymore. So not only is it better for the user uh, from a building perspective, but it's also better from an SEO and page speed because then you don't need that third party plugin anymore. Wow. That was a big change. It would be interesting, uh, interesting to see, actually, but I probably can answer the question myself. You know, one of the things with Vix and, and those companies and um, what's the other company's name? Uh, the, um, Squarespace. Uh, Square, uh, Squarespace. You know, we talked about that, that their platforms are really not optimized for SEO and, and the, the challenges they have. They we developed top down, you know, where the, making the user interface very, very good, but the, the details, the bottom, the base is not there. Mm -hmm. Now, WordPress is coming the other way around. They come from the base. They have all the depth. Yeah. Now they put a, a, a good uh, user interface on top of it, which is much easier, which you know would make me believe that they will succeed with this, uh, um, with that strategy. Um, so it will be interesting to see. Yeah, you can definitely tell that this update is, you know, their first response to Google Core Web Vitals updates with uh, page speed and mm -hmm. user experience overall. I think that a lot of these updates are taking that into consideration and finding, you know, unique creative ways to help your users kind of make that first step into like the, the benchmarks that you need to hit. The page editors are definitely huge, you know, that you know, there's a big companies living off of the revenue. Uh, uh, it was the WP Baker, right? Yeah, uh, Bakery, yeah. Bakery is, is a big one. You know, I think we use that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be interesting to see. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about today is actually the uh, advantages and challenges of diversified advertising. I saw a study um, that came out this week from uh, Facebook and then Market Dive. Um, they, they, used that and, and did some additional, had some additional um, uh, research um, regarding uh, diversified advertising. Um, and 71% um, of consumers expect diversified um, advertising, mm -hmm. but only 54% of people feel that they're culturally represented in, in, uh, uh, in online advertising, um, which is we, really, you know, there's a, there's like a 20, 20% 20 uh, difference um, mm -hmm. because it's rather short-sighted from brands because 
59% of consumers say that they are more loyal to brands that stand for diversity. So it doesn't really pay, um, or it, it's really, there's no advantage of not being diversified. And then, you know, they, they further looked into, um, you know, how it is very, you know, um, categorized very often and how, how people do the advertising. Women are more likely than, uh, more, um, are more than 14 times more likely to be shown in revealing clothes. Mm -hmm. And then the other, uh, on, on the flip side, which I thought was interesting, never thought about it, but then when I read it, I thought, oh yeah, I, I believe that. Men are more likely to be shown angry and less happy. So that's mm -hmm. more on the, the women's side. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so the diversification is not always just, you know, based on, on uh, skin color and, and culture or whatever. Um, and then uh, also what's also interesting related to it's really not paying uh, to not trying to be diversified is we, th there was some research done was really interesting um, and uh, the research was how much can the ad be recalled by people you know what's how memorable is it and it has shown that um, in 90% of the cases you have a higher recall um, benefit in with diverse advertising that in my opinion that itself is it's a, a huge statistic now the reason why I, it, it's um we talk about this often especially when it comes down to website development but also even the advertising or when we have new clients you know we have these discussions with clients and uh you know let, let me exclude preface by uh, saying I want to exclude on what I'm saying now the big companies that have the big budgets but when it comes down to small business or mid-sized business that don't have the big budgets it's actually not always that easy to have diversified um, let's say marketing done um, most companies you know agencies like us and, and even non-agencies they use um, libraries image libraries mm -hmm as the basis. And when you look at the image libraries, they tried hard the last few years to have more diversified images. Um, so, you know, generically you can say, yes, I can find basically images for all kinds of, you know, cultures and, and segments of the population. That is true. However, once you re have specific needs or niche needs, the diversification becomes very, very difficult, you know, to say, okay, let's say an orthopedic practice might say, we want to have all cultures represented, all skin colors or whatever. It's easy. But if you say, you know, I want, I'm a, a cardiovascular uh, uh, um, practice. And for that, what our, for a specific service, I want to have people at the age of, um, well, over 60 or over 70 being active outside. You know, once you get specific, it becomes actually very difficult mm -hmm. um, to get to, uh, it's not as easy, I should say, that's the better way of saying it, to be, to do diversified advertising. And I think the industry, especially the image industry, still has a long way to go. And you know, on the consumer side, we should keep that in mind that for small businesses, it's not always that easy to be diversified and be good at the same time. Because at the end of the day, you want to have imagery that fits to what you want to convey. So you're at the, you have to weigh diversification versus not quite having the image that we really fits to, to mm -hmm. what you want to convey. It's a real challenge, and I think it's not talked about enough um, because I think we should keep companies like us. We should keep pushing, you know, basically the behind the scenes industries and companies that actually are partially fall on driving some of the lack of diversification. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, for someone who's using, you know, Shutterstock or Adobe stock almost every single day, I agree. That's, you know, one of the more difficult tasks that I have. 
Um, and it is our responsibility, you know, when we do use these services that we provide them the feedback that we, we're not finding what we're looking for. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's why a lot of small businesses have started also using platforms like uh, Canva, where you kind of create your own, you know, mm -hmm. branded imagery rather than using like these lifestyle stock images. I think people have started shifting into more, um, you know, patterns and te like uh, text based imagery and things like that. Um, which, I mean, after a while also gets boring when your whole feed looks exactly the same. So it, it's about finding that balance. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. And we always recommend to our clients if they can afford it to, to do, um, to use non-stock image, meaning we, we have a uh, uh, videographer and stock, uh, uh, a photographer and staff. And so whenever we can, we prefer, and they're also just more general. Consumers react better to, real imagery that are custom to your, to your, uh, uh, uh company. Yep. Um, but again, it's, it's not always that easy. Um, so very interesting. Okay. That concludes, uh, this week's podcast. I hope you thought it was interesting. Uh, I certainly was, uh, see you next week. Bye.